Hey, it's Penny Black and Jill Foster here for another PB&J card class. And today I have another card featuring our gorgeous new stamp called Crimson Blush. I just love working with this stamp. It's great for no-line watercoloring techniques. So I have another one of those to share with you today. And it has a little twist to it. Uh, but before I begin, I'm just popping up here a list of all the supplies I'll be using in creating this card, including the exact colors of the paints that I'm using as well. And I will put this full supply list back up at the very end of the video. So if you want to look at it in more detail when it comes up on screen, you can just hit pause and look at it closer at that time. So to begin, I'm going to stamp this rose, this penny black rose called Crimson Blush, onto a Canson 140 pound watercolor paper and it is a cold pressed paper so it does have some texture to it so I'm stamping this in my misty so I can do multiple impressions I'm also using a water soluble very light ink to get the no line look so I've chosen antique linen distress ink to do my stamping and I am stamping it multiple times. I hate when I have to really try to see the light image and it just hurts my eyes. So I do prefer to stamp it a few times and if a little bit of the outline or the details show, I think it actually adds to the final effect. But if that bothers you, I would just recommend only stamp it like once or twice until you get a complete design. Now I am going to position this, I did it one time going right up the center of the card and I'm going to get it a couple other times on the left and the right of this card panel. So that's something I, else I really love about the stamp besides just the beautiful way that it's illustrated. It does allow you to do a lot of different ways of positioning it and stamping it multiple times on the front of your card so that you can make a lots of cards with just this one stamp and they're all going to look very different depending on just how you position the stamp on the panel or what techniques you use to color it in. Like I said, on this video, I'm going to show a no-line watercoloring technique, but I've also done some cards with the stamp where I've stamped it just in a dark ink and colored it in with watercolors, not trying to do the no-line watercolor technique, and that looks beautiful too. So here I'll just finish up the stamping and I'm ready to get rolling with my painting. Now I did stamp this once on a piece of scratch paper and I added some color where, just scribble coloring, where I wanted the shadows to be and the light areas to be. And that's just a reference for me as I am painting. And I'm going to use the Sakura Koi Field Sketch Box to do my painting. Like I said, I'll have all of the exact colors listed at the very end of the video up on screen in the supply list. And this is a technique I actually learned at a watercolor class. I had never tried it before and the instructor had us paint an entire flower, do an underpainting with a blue color and just to help us develop where the areas of light and dark will be. Then we went back and added our color right on top of the blue. And it was, I was really amazed at the depth of the shadows that I got by doing that. So I thought this would be the perfect stamp to do this technique with. So what I'm doing, I have my reference photo just right over to the side and I am adding my blue paint only in the very darkest shadow areas. And I don't want this blue to get too dark. Like right here where I'm painting, it did get a little bit dark. You can go in and lighten it up like I'm doing by adding more water and then picking it up with a thirsty brush, which is basically a brush that, brush that you've dried off and then you kind of go in and lift up some of the color. But that is one thing you want to watch out for is don't get too heavy handed with your blue, with your darker color, because it will get pretty dark when you add your red back on top. Now I'm making this a red rose, so the blue works really well. If I was going to do, say, like a yellow rose, I would recommend doing your underpainting in, say, like a brown or a sepia color um, that would blend better with the color, like the yellow that you're going to do. Now because my water is not going out over the entire petal, I can work sort of petals that are next to each other, as you can see here, because I'm not having one wet area touch another wet area. I'm putting the paint straight from my palette on my brush, right onto a dry petal, then going back with my wet brush that's mostly water to blend that as it extends out beyond the petals. And I hope as you watch this, this will sort of start to make a little bit more sense. I think the best way to learn it is to jump in there and start doing it. You can see there one of the um, finished roses. I'm going to work on one of these for you. And I'm so sorry. I try so hard not to get my head in the picture. I know that's not very helpful. Um, 
but sometimes it's just difficult when you're trying to really see what you're doing. I don't know, I feel like I must need to have my face like two inches away from the paper when I'm painting sometimes. So again, you can see my head. Hold on here. <laughs> I'm putting, I promise what I'm doing is painting. I'm putting that color down straight from my brush onto the darkest area and going back then with a wet brush to blend that out. So the first time it hits the petal, it's mostly pigment on the brush. I rinse off the brush in my cup of water and the second time it comes back, it's mostly water on the brush so I can move that out and lighten it as it extends on. So there's the first touch with pigment and the next touch mostly with water to help it blend out. And I am finding it was quite useful to have that reference that I had made just with scribble coloring with markers as I was working. One, because it's no line water coloring, so it helps if you're having trouble seeing what the actual image is because it is stamped so light. By creating something like that myself, I was already very familiar then with the stamp, with the different petals and the different areas, and that helped then when I went to apply the paint. And as I was doing this, I also kept thinking, hmm, this kind of looks nice in blue. Um, so if you wanted to do something like this, if you didn't want it to be a blue rose, but you just want it to be very simply colored, you could just do this with red like I'm doing. Um, follow this technique with red or what pink or whatever color you want your rose to be. And even that looks really nice. It gives it a fun look too. Next, I will move on to the leaves. One thing um, that I was really happy with when this turned out was I was very careful to maintain the white in the center of the leaf, so sort of that vein that runs down the center. So um, that's something I definitely would be careful to do again, and I felt like I really learned from that that I liked the look. So right next to that center vein that runs down the leaf is my darkest color. And sort of those extending veins got some of the darker color. But I will leave that center part white. So you'll see here I'm going straight with mostly pigment on my brush, right up next to that center line but not overlapping it. And then I will blend it out with water. I'm getting these ones nice and dark, those extending veins. And the blue underpainting was especially helpful on the leaves because when you add the green on top, they really blend together quite nicely. And here I'm going in with mostly water on my brush to sort of blend those edges. It does not need to be too perfect though because remember this is just an underpainting to establish where the darkest and lightest areas are on the painting. So if it's not an exactly perfectly blended edge, you're going to, we're going to put more paint on top. So it kind of eliminates some of that stress at this point. This is just to help you know where it's light and where it's dark. There's just a closer look at those leaves. Now everything is dry and I'm going in right on top of that with my red paint. Now it will affect the look of the red and you can add more layers if you want that to have less of a purple look or more of an orangey look. I put my pigment right down on those darkest areas right on top of the blue and now I will blend that out with mostly water on my brush. And you can see how you get these really rich dark shadows from having that underpainting. Now to give that more of a red look, I am dropping in a lot more of red pigment. So my brush has a lot more red on it at this point. When it went off camera, I rinsed it off, dabbed it on my paper towel, and I can go back and blend that some more. 
Now while that is still wet, I decided to pop in just a little bit of yellow, just pouncing it in and letting the water blend that. I will caution you to be careful with the yellow because of the blue underpainting that is there. You don't want to put too much yellow on top of the blue or it does get muddy. And I do have a few spots where that happens, but you can just keep layering more colors on top to fix it. In my mind, at this point in this painting, I thought even if something goes terribly wrong, I'm going to find a way to fix it because I had a lot of time invested in it at this point. To me, this is so relaxing to sit and paint this image. And I, you know, I did the underpainting first and came back to it at a different time to do the red on top. But just the watercoloring, watching it move and flow and come together petal by petal is just, to me, it's a very relaxing thing. And this rose is so perfect to try lots of different techniques and coloring mediums with. Now you will notice at this time I am working on petals that do not touch. Because I am wetting down pretty much the whole petal as I work, I don't want to work on two that are right next to each other because then they'll start to bleed and blend into each other. You can use a heat tool to dry them in between, but I found I didn't need to do that. I had plenty of petals and leaves and things I could work on before I had any trouble with any running into each other that were going to touch. Now these were the areas where it got a little bit trickier because I had quite a bit of blue covering the petals. So I will put multiple layers on as they dry and even while they're wet in order to make sure that that red color is a distinct red and not too purple, too purpley or too muddy. So here I'm just showing you a few of the different petals so you can get some ideas on where to add that shading. Another place to look when you're trying to decide where to add the darker and lighter colors is right on the packaging that comes with your stamp. There's a lot of ideas there where you can do highlights and the dark to light shading. And I'm just again bouncing around on all the different petals to areas that are still um, that are dry so that the two areas next to it are still dry. I also was careful to leave some areas of white especially at the tips of the petals. Now here's a look at the leaves. This was my favorite part. I'm adding some green just right on top of that underpainting and look how it instantly looks nice and dark and shaded. And you can just keep playing with um, adding details in there on the leaves and the veins. I also, while it's still wet, add a touch of the red that was used on the flowers. That gives a nice look to the leaves as if that flower that's right next to it is sort of reflecting its color onto the leaf. You can keep dropping in more paint as you go. If you get too much, just lift it up with a thirsty brush or a dry brush. Not totally dry, but mostly dry, dabbed off on your paper towel. So here I'm just kind of wetting that and getting ready to drop in some green paint. The first dropping in there was mostly pigment on my brush. I'm rinsing it off now and coming back in with water to blend it. So the first dropping in of color was pigment mainly on my brush, rinse it off and come back with water to blend. Here I added a touch of yellow along the tips of the leaves. and a little bit of red there. And a kind of a brighter green there too. And now all of those roses have dried and I had a few spots that were just not as vibrant as I wanted them to be. So I like the shadows and it had a vintage look but there was just a little too much of the blue showing for me. So I'm going in with some more red and just putting that right on top and that's just going to give those even more of a vibrant look. So you certainly wouldn't have to do this step, but I love to just keep fiddling around and working with the colors, making it brighter. That's a lot of the fun for me, so that's what I kept doing here with this, with this stamping and with this technique.
Now, once that was dry, I went ahead and started working on my background. I just painted some water around the areas where I would be painting the background. And then I am dropping in that same blue paint that I did the underpainting with. So this is a very nice subtle way to add a shadow and it matches up beautifully because that blue is kind of interwoven throughout the roses and throughout the leaves. And I promise this is gonna come back up into the frame very soon here. Here we go. So it's wet and I'm just dropping in that blue right next to the roses to the leaves and then blending it out with water. I want the most intense color to be right up next to the images. And you do want to take care not to re-wet, uh, like if you get the leaf wet again, it could start to bleed out. So you just want to be careful about that as you paint your water on and as you drop in that blue color. And you can keep blending that and adding more. I wanted it to be pretty subtle though, so this is a fairly light background for me. So I'm just putting down that water and then working my way up. By having that layer of water there, it buys you some time to blend it. And that blue will start to bring out those shadow areas on the rose and make give it even more depth. I also added a touch of that blue and green here right at the base of these leaves where they're attaching to the stems. So I kept that white highlight and I was really happy with that, but I think it needed just a little bit of shadow there on top of it. So I'm going in and adding that. It's very light, very subtle. It dries even lighter than it looks there. And then with a very fine tip brush, I'm just picking up a very dark, um, dark color. And in sort of the crevices, the darkest, darkest areas, I'm adding just a little, little bit of that color. And that makes the petal that's on top really pop up. You don't wanna do this along every border and line, but just here and there will make a big difference and be just use a very small amount. Once all that was dry, I was ready to stamp my sentiment. I kept things real simple. I did embellish this with a couple of die cut butterflies and then also added, I put those on with foam squares and added some self-adhesive pearls to the centers of those and that finished the card. I thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed seeing this rose come to life with a little bit different spin on the no-line watercoloring technique using some underpainting to add even more depth to your shadows. If you enjoyed today's video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also connect with Penny Black on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, on our website and blog, and shop our online store. And I will have all of those linked for you down in the YouTube description box below. And here's a list of all the supplies used, including the colors of paint. Thanks for watching.